Five Books and Counting, The Tales from the Omni Vault continues to expand as a universe. Go ahead and check the links down in the description to get your copies today. Uh, Snazzy, do you know this individual? Honestly, no. She was here when I got in, and she hasn't said a word the whole time. Oh, don't worry, fellas. She's with me. Oh, Rodney, hi. You know her? Yeah, this is my girlfriend, Doris Stowe. Uh, she don't talk much until she gets to know people. Hope you don't mind I brought her along. Well, hey, any girlfriend of yours is a platonic friend of ours. Of course I don't mind her staying. Snazzy, do you mind? How'd a runt like you score a babe three times your size? Snazzy! All right, sure, sure, she can stay. There you go. Welcome to our humble abode, Doris. Well, I got a Christmas video to make. If anyone needs me, I'll be in the studio. Seriously, how did this happen? Hey, what can I say? Some guys got it, and some guys don't. Why do I feel like that was a targeted insult? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Omni Viewer, and I don't usually like being negative at Christmas time. That being said, though, I just can't let this go. There's a Christmas story involving the Looney Tunes, a short film that could have been great, but unfortunately it failed worse than a trap set for the Roadrunner. It is a Yuletide yarn simply entitled Bah Humduck. It's Christmas Eve, the most lucrative time of the year for Daffy Duck since he owns the Lucky Duck Superstore. He's raking in the moolah, but he's also being a terrible employer to the many Looney Tunes who work for him. Local Christmas expert Bugs Bunny warns the duck that if he keeps being awful, he'll be haunted by ghosts, which Daffy scoffs at until the ghosts show up. So, just to be clear, this is a Looney Tunes version of A Christmas Carol, right? You had to ask? I thought it was obvious. Yes, guys, this is a Looney Tunes adaptation of the most adapted piece of classic literature ever. And I really wish I could say it was good. On the surface, the story sounds like it should work. Putting a Looney Tunes spin on the story with Daffy in the Scrooge role makes total sense. I can even give the film some credit for certain things it does well. The animation is stellar for a direct-to-video feature, even topping some of the more recent DC animated movies. Just look at it all. This animation is bright, vibrant, smooth, and never slows down. I also like how they brought in a full orchestra to provide the music like the classic cartoons did, and it matches the animation splendidly. It has a nice jazzy quality to it that I bet would sound just as good on its own as it does within the movie. Finally, despite what I'm about to say, I can appreciate the choice to not make this a straight adaptation of the Dickens story, thus allowing it more liberty to mess around with things. If I could keep being positive for the rest of this video, I would. But unfortunately, Bah Humduck is really bad. The issues begin with the pacing. One good quality of the original Christmas Carol is how it moves at a brisk pace, containing barely any fat and making sure every word is important to the narrative. Bah Humduck doesn't follow that example. The beginning is used to establish that Daffy is a bad boss who mistreats his employees, either by generally overworking them or by showing specific examples of abuse. Elmer is at the point of exhaustion, barely able to stay awake. Marvin wants to return to Mars and be with his family. Porky can't afford the doll his daughter wants because his salary is so laughably small. And everyone else is just generally overworked and mistreated. Daffy is even terrible to his customers. We establish all of that very quickly at the beginning, but the movie beleaguers the point by stretching it out. How far is it stretched, I hear you ask? Well, establishing how wretched Daffy is takes a solid 14 minutes, at which point Sylvester shows up in the Marley role. If you think that's when the Dickensian portion finally kicks in, you're wrong. Once Sylvester leaves, the movie apparently thinks you might have forgotten how Daffy is abusing his employees or how greedy he is, so it spends more time reiterating what we already know, meaning it's not until the 25-minute mark that the Ghost of Christmas Past appears. Hang on, how long is this movie again? With opening and closing credits, 45 minutes. Wait a minute, you mean this thing is more than halfway over before the plot even gets started? I'm afraid so, and once the spirits do show up, they have to rush through the past, present, and future segments before time runs out. There's a whole lot of setup for very little payoff. 
You know, the whole point was to adapt a Christmas carol with the Looney Tunes in it. But instead, we spend nearly a half hour with the characters in the mall, with a Dickensian speed run right at the end. Something also needs to be said about the slapstick in this movie. Now wait a minute, Omni. These are the Looney Tunes we're talking about. They're known for their slapstick. You're not gonna tell me this movie messes that up too, are ya? Think of it this way, Rodney. You ever see a Christmas special where the lesson is that Christmas every day is a bad idea because it ultimately diminishes the meaning of the holiday? Yeah, the old too much of a good thing lesson. It's a classic, really. Same idea, different application. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, of slapstick in this movie. Barely a minute can go by without someone getting hit by something or falling from a great height, and it's just too much. Look, not even the original shorts had this much slapstick in them. There was also a lot of verbal jousting, and sometimes the slapstick would be set up in such elaborate ways that the setup was just as funny as the payoff. Here, characters just keep getting smashed, dropped, blown up, kicked, and what all else to the point where it's excessive. And once the Christmas ghosts show up, they continue the physical abuse. It all becomes the visual equivalent of white noise, whatever you would call that. This is where I must pause to provide some feedback on how this could have been done better. You see, in the film as is, the butt of most of the jokes is Daffy, which is pretty normal for the Looney Tunes, except that here it undermines his status at the beginning of the film. Remember, Daffy is supposed to be the one in charge, and by extension the one abusing his staff. Yet he suffers most of the abuse throughout the beginning and continues getting bashed by the ghosts. What might have worked better is if Daffy inflicted the slapstick at the beginning or simply ignored his employee's suffering and doesn't get a taste of it himself until Bugs confronts him. That just provides a taste though, and his pummeling would mostly be inflicted by the ghosts. Think of it like those classic shorts where Daffy is pitted against Speedy Gonzales. He's a villain who wields power at first, then the hero shows up and he gets what's coming to him. Yeah, I can see how that would fit. Normally, the Christmas ghosts are there to save the Scrooge character, so they don't get any worse than being a bit passive-aggressive. Here, they're so disgusted with Daffy that they can't help but smack him upside the head. They're still here to save him, but they're also giving him a whooping at the same time, and it would have had more of an impact if he hadn't suffered prior to that. It would be a very Looney Tunes way to approach things. And I will forever wonder why they didn't take that approach. Now to be clear, the movie slapstick isn't bad on its own. Any one of these gags would work fine in a film with better pacing. The choice to inundate us with slapstick, though, means it goes from funny to boring very quickly. And that's on top of the repetitive storytelling. Okay, but what about the moral? Chuck's original story is all about redemption and understanding, so it has to at least get that part right, doesn't it? It comes close, Rodney. So very close, but it doesn't get there. And that might be the biggest frustration of all. At the heart of A Christmas Carol is a story of how a man became embittered to the point of being needlessly cruel, and the self-reflection he undergoes to turn over a new leaf. Bah Humduck tries to incorporate this element, but, well, you can probably guess how well that went by now. For starters, the movie does a few things that seem like they should be brilliant when juxtaposed with the original book. The Ghost of Christmas Past role is divided between Granny and Tweety, which seems weird if you don't know the source material. Dickens describes this ghost as looking simultaneously young and old, a description that has caused many headaches for people in charge of visual adaptations. In Bah Humduck, the description is realized by casting the young Tweety and old Granny, and credit where credit is due, that was clever. Then you have other casting choices that go totally against type. Yosemite Sam is absolutely the wrong choice for the huge, jolly ghost of Christmas present, but I imagine that was the point, and on its own, seeing him in the role is amusing. Meanwhile, casting Taz in the Ghost of Christmas Future role lands somewhere in between. He's obviously a weird choice for a character that's meant to be silent, but he's a fitting choice for a character meant to be frightening, which Taz is compared to the others. If only it had spent more time with them so we could really flesh out their presence. Instead, we're just left with a bunch of cameos that are mildly amusing, but don't really amount to much. Indeed, but even that missed opportunity pales in comparison to what this movie does on a thematic level. There are a few lines in that overly long first act, which, in hindsight, 
actually do foreshadow the source of Daffy's foul attitude. He keeps insisting that he hates families and only wants to be left alone with his money. At one point, he lets it slip that he fears personal intimacy, and it seems like a joke until we learn his origin. That brings us to the past segment where we learn Daffy's tragic backstory. And again, it comes so close to actually meaning something, but... Well, let's actually examine it. The past is where we learn that in this universe, Daffy was an orphan at the Lucky Duck Orphanage, and he was always overlooked when prospective parents came to adopt. He did want a family, but he never got one, and this gradually made him bitter, emotionally distant, and determined to find happiness and financial success. Like I said, this comes so darn close to being layered. First of all, even with all the movie's problems, it's impossible to watch this scene and not feel at least a little bad for Daffy. The name of the orphanage also carries weight, as it bears the same name as Daffy Superstore, I'm sure you noticed. Daffy probably took the name because he thought it was a form of ironic vengeance, but instead it shows that he's still a prisoner of his trauma. The orphan duckling he used to be never left the orphanage, he just tried to reshape it in his image as a coping mechanism. He may have convinced himself that it works, but to everyone else, it obviously hasn't. Now bear in mind, I'm only withdrawing all of that from the movie because I'm a storyteller myself, and as a storyteller, that's what I would have done had I been in charge. As it is, though, the movie barely even dwells on any of the layers it puts forward. Tweety and Granny just speed through the exposition, declare that good enough, and end the segment without any real catharsis. We don't see Daffy grow into a greedy jerk because, as mentioned, there's no time, so we're just told that's what happened and then we must move on. A different misstep occurs in the present segment, where Daffy witnesses Porky and Priscilla's home life. Now, these two are clearly meant to represent the Cratchits, but not exactly. They're not a huge family, Priscilla isn't sickly, and Porky is a single father ever since the implied death of his wife. They kill Petunia? Dang, that's cold. And coming from a resident of the North Pole, that's saying something. Now the movie goes out of its way to show that Priscilla is a pure-hearted little girl. When we first meet her, she's collecting money for charity, and we're told multiple times throughout that all she wants for Christmas is a pretty pudgy piggy doll and to spend Christmas with her dad. Just one material object and quality time with family. Who would object to that? The problem is that a little too much emphasis is placed on her wanting that doll. It's the primary thing she talks about, and she even mentions it first when wishing upon a star. By the end, she not only gets the doll, but also gets every single accessory for it, which is part of the happy ending. Heck, even Sam gives Daffy grief specifically for depriving the girl of the only toy she wants. The takeaway is that her happiness somehow hinges on her getting the doll, which is weird when juxtaposed with the movie's overall negative view of consumerism. There's actually a deleted scene that could have fixed it. In this alternate take, Priscilla says it's okay if there are no presents as long as she can spend Christmas with Porky, which de-emphasizes the doll's importance. I'm actually surprised they didn't use it considering they went through all the trouble of fully animating it. And that's only one of two deleted scenes that add substance to this movie. The other one extends the orphanage scene by paying homage to a Charlie Brown Christmas, but let's be honest, the past segment still needed more than just this. Every other deleted scene, despite being finished, which is rare for any animated feature, doesn't really expand anything that would need it. That's a little off topic, I admit, but I still wanted to point it out. The majority of the deleted scenes would not help the movie if they were added back in. Getting back on track, the future segment also speeds through things, bringing us right to the graveyard so Porky can deliver exposition on Daffy's dire fate. Once again, we get close to something moving when Priscilla reveals that she forgives Daffy. Despite how awful he was, she understands and still chooses to love him, which is what finally gets through to the greedy duck and spurs his full redemption. She's even the one who grounds him when he's about to relapse. Again, it's so close to being impactful, but it needed more build-up than it got. There could have been a genuine connection between these two, but there's nothing to support it. The foundation that the ghost segments were supposed to lay down is sparse, making the whole thing a proverbial house built on sand. As such, the emotion, no matter how genuine it's trying to be, falls flat. 
So, can you see why I think this movie is nothing but wasted potential? There could have been something great here, I really believe that. Too much effort was put in for me to call this cheap and lazy. Unfortunately, what could have been and what is are separated by miles. And it's really a shame that poor time management and overuse of physical humor kneecapped this movie. I don't want to end this on a negative note, so I'll try to put a little bit of a positive spin on this. Bah Humduck is still a bad movie, make no mistake of that. But then again, a negative example can still be an example. So if this movie can serve any purpose, let it be a sign of what not to do when adapting a Christmas carol, or just writing a story in general. That's the best I can do. It's a way for me to somehow impart some knowledge to other people aspiring to be storytellers themselves. Using something in the past to make a lesson for the present to impart for a future generation? Now that's keeping in the spirit of the original story. And so may it remain. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omni Viewer wishing you all a Merry Christmas on behalf of the whole team. to get some eggnog. Uh, by the way, Omni, that's an interesting new look you adopted for this video. You think so? I found it while Christmas shopping and it just felt right. Oh, I didn't say it was right, but whatever makes your sleigh fly. Thank you all for watching. Now be sure to head down to the description to check us out on other platforms as well as find links to the five current books in the Tales from the Omni Vault universe. Again, thank you all, and we'll see you next time.